Hi, uh, my name is Jürgen Klein. Bob asked me to talk just a bit about the Open Knowledge Conference that took place a couple of weeks ago in Geneva. And he asked me to select some hot topics. What I actually did in the end was select four events that I went to, four talks, and I thought I'd just give you a very brief um, selection of nuggets that came out of those. So this was a conference webpage, it took place over two days, there were about a thousand people there, and a lot of those were people from NGOs um, or public bodies. There were a wide variety of topics discussed, pretty much everything you could think of that might be prefixed by open. <laughs> That's represented. But there's a particularly big emphasis, at least as far as I can tell, on um, development and um, development policies. However, all those were well represented. So, the f one talk which got rave reviews and was really impressive and inspiring was by Jay Naidu, who <coughs> was at one point working in Nelson Mandela's cabinet. And he was arguing very strongly for putting the whole open data movement within the context of the struggle for greater fairness, equality, and addressing poverty. So he was looking at, particularly from the point of view of South Africa, and he was addressing the audience as probably an audience not unlike you, as the young digital warriors. Well, I wasn't so young, but <laughs> some of you are not. And he was really arguing that things like open data and all the technology around it can actually be used to make a significant, crucial difference in dealing with inequality and vested interests. So, in particular, he was talking about transparency in governance and how a lot of money gets money which could be used for social good <coughs> is siphoned off by political elites that having better systems for tracking how money percolates through the system all the way down to communities is a way of trying to ensure that it actually goes to the people it's intended for, particularly when it's coming from donor organisations. <coughs> and he really emphasised that the importance and, and, and fundamental point that the whole reason for embarking on the open data enterprise is to bring a greater sense of justice, uh, quality and ethics to what he called the global narrative. So that was, that was a great talk. Um, there was also an interesting presentation by people from the World Bank, which I hadn't expected um, at all. So this is a couple of speakers, Sam Lee and Philippe Estefan, <coughs> and they were talking about dealing with the fact that most people are offline most of the time. So if you think of open data as literally just being something you only can publish or consume electronically, how do you bridge that? <coughs> there was also a very good point made that a lot of the work in open data, I think is not true of open street map, of course, but a lot of, particularly in public service information, government data, is very much oriented towards the supply side. How do we publish more, more, more? It doesn't really address <coughs> what the demand is. And so looking at how people might frame the, the problem in terms of asking for data rather than pushing it out was, was a crucial issue there. And they focus in particular on the way in which development agencies who might have local projects do make their financial data publicly open, but it's not really used and therefore doesn't really have much value. And they, described two pilot projects, one in Indonesia and one in Kenya, which were trying to take the financial data that was published by ongoing development projects to the communities. 
And they didn't say an awful lot about what the impact were in concrete terms, but they did mention a couple of cases that local people noticed that projects had been costed and claimed for, but actually hadn't been carried out. So there was a gap there between what the development agencies thought had happened and what actually had happened. And they <coughs> used existing networks, group networks, within both those communities to set up meetings, initial meetings with facilitators to describe what's happening um, with these local projects. And there's a variety of them as you can see. And initially tried to get some of the financial data made available on paper. And although they, they had encountered the stereotype that local people couldn't understand this data, <coughs> wouldn't be interested in it, they actually found the reverse, that people were very interested once they could have it presented to them in, in, in an appropriate format. And they then tried to, I think quite successfully, get a follow-on activity where members of the community tried to figure out which of those strands were particularly important for them and then disseminate them more widely within the community to get further engagement and further feedback. Um, so I think that, that those are both very interesting projects. Um, next, uh, I wanted to mention a presentation in the area of called Evidence and Stories. This is particularly on visualising information. <coughs> and these two people represent an organisation called Tactical Technology Collective, who have just published the book with this title. And they talked about a variety of topics. One which was particularly striking was a movement to try to bring about greater awareness around issues of discrimination against women in India. And this was not their campaign, it was a campaign they mentioned as a, as a case study, which used the juxtaposition of literal deification of women within the Hindu pantheon, pantheon juxtaposed with very routine abuse, domestic abuse. And this particular set of images, which is one of the variety, brought this up quite starkly. This has actually been quite controversial, a lot of people have objected to it. <clears throat> On the other hand, it does seem to have been successful in having impact. And they categorised visualisation activities in advocacy along three dimensions, or three levels of, um, sort of progress. So, get the idea, get the picture, get the detail. So, get the idea would be something like this, where you just really put something in people's faces, literally, um, to try and avoid a reaction and expose an issue. The next level would actually perhaps involve a more detailed visualisation, though not a lot of stories, and then something which might actually allow you to lead into the data if you get the detail. So they have a book about this which I haven't read, but it's that's pretty interesting. Um, finally, I'm going to mention a workshop on open transport run by Peter Colcraft and Chloe Bonnet. And there were a number of issues discussed during that workshop. One of them was how do you deal with end-to-end -end journeys, how do you do the planning for them, particularly when they cross national boundaries. And within the UK that's still not such an issue. But <coughs> clearly if you're on the continent then you almost can't go anywhere, certainly in that part of the world without crossing a boundary. <coughs> and this seems to be a, a way of trying to mobilise that community around a set of problems. This was a slide by Tristram Gravener, which illustrated some of those issues to do with identifying <coughs> places which might be points on a route. So you mentioned that Geneva has at least three different ways of being spelt, but it should not be confused 
general Genova. And also the, the identifiers <coughs> for particular locations vary a lot depending on which particular organization it is who is trying to deal with the data. So I, I guess this is just one location, but it has four different unique identifiers. So there's a key technical issue there about how do you come up with some way of mapping between those. And he mentioned other problems to do with uh, recognizing names, such as Gare de Lyon is a station in Paris, not in Lyon. There is a couple of sites that they've been developing, which I haven't got on the slides now, but I will try and put these slides up on SlideShare and add some references to those of you who uh, would like to follow up on that. Um, Okay, so those are the four topics that I, I wanted to focus on. I just thought I'd mention a couple of things. So, <clears throat> OKCon OK was a big event. There will be a more community-oriented one next year called OK Fest, which will be in July in Berlin. <clears throat> there's a website already there, but there's not much on it yet. Uh, there's going to be an Open Data Scotland event on the 10th of December. Which, like, I don't know if any of you have been to conferences organised by Hollywood, they're somewhat oriented towards um, big organisations and government. I don't know a lot of details about what we've been involved in this, but I think it's still a useful event to get people from Scottish government in particular um, to kind of come stand up to the plate and say, this is what we're going to do, because so far they haven't really done that. Finally, I want to briefly plug the Activities Open Knowledge Foundation of Scotland. There's a website there. There's open data meetups. The next one in Glasgow. Oh, shh, sorry. <laughs> Type, cut and paste over there. That should be in Glasgow. It's Monday the 18th of November in the Centre of Contemporary Arts. And <clears throat> the one on the 21st of the Medina. The one in Glasgow does have involvement of the Future Cities um, initiative and there will be people from there talking if that's something that's been following up. That's it, thank you very much.